Welcome to the College Credit Plus presentation for Oregon City Schools. So what is College Credit Plus? CCP, College Credit Plus, is Ohio's dual enrollment program. So it provides students in grades seven through 12 an opportunity that they can take college classes and they can earn high school credits at the same time by taking courses at a college while they're still in school. So where can these college classes be taken? You can take them at the public university or you can take them at a participating private university. You may travel to the college where you've been admitted or you may enroll in online courses offered by that college. So it's really up to you if you wanna go on campus to take the classes or if you wanna take them from the comfort of home through an online mode. You may take all courses through the college or you can decide to do some courses at college and some courses in Oregon schools. It's really up to you how you want to do that. We have several of our students who do full-time CCP. We have several students who do just one class of CCP and do the rest through Oregon. Um, we have some that split their time half and half. It's really just a personal preference for you. So who pays for the college admission, textbook, fees, etc.? Um, students who attend a public college will not be charged for tuition or books. Students that attend a private college may be charged based on that particular private college. Students have to return their CCP textbooks. So when they go to CCP, they're going to get a textbook, which Oregon pays for, and they have to return that to me if they purchase the book as soon as the semester completes. If the books are not returned to me, we will issue a fee for that. Um, I send to the school email and to the parent email that's provided in PowerSchool, I will send a reminder that books are coming due. Students may also be charged for fees such as parking passes, student ID badges. Not all colleges will charge for these things, but some may. Students are responsible for their own transportation, so Oregon will not transport students to and from CCP classes. So basically to sum up that slide, Oregon City Schools is going to pay for everything CCP related unless you don't turn a book in or unless you fail a class, which we'll talk about here in a while. There may be small fees that the college implements such as those student IDs or something along that line. Financial arrangements, there's two options, option A and option B. I would imagine that all of you are here for option B, which is the free option where Oregon pays for the CCP classes. In option A, students would elect to take the course for college credit, but they're gonna have financial responsibility for all tuition, books, materials, and fees. Oregon will accept no financial responsibility for those students who will be paying their own tuition and fees and books. The arrangements are between the college and the student. Credits earned under this option A will not appear on the student's high school transcript. Option B, which is what I'm assuming you will want, is where students can elect to take a college course for both high school and college credit from a public college or university or a participating private university, and expenses will be paid by the Oregon district. Again, private post-secondary institutions may charge a student a fee per credit hour for these courses that are taken, and the student would be responsible for paying that. You cannot take remedial or religious courses. They're not covered under option B. So you can take a general religion course, like a survey of major world religions, but you can't take a specific religion like a class on Catholicism. Under option B, if a student fails a course, if they drop or add a course after the CCP set deadlines, if they receive a withdraw fail, an incomplete, or a no credit, the student is going to be responsible for payment of all fees that incurred, including tuition and the textbook. So option B, Oregon pays for everything. However, we're going to ask for reimbursement if you do not receive a passing grade for that class. As far as graduation requirements go, students can use college credit for, I'm sorry, can use college courses for credit toward high school graduation. So what that means is that if you take a composition one class at University of Toledo, that would count for a full credit of language arts on the high school transcript. It is the responsibility of the student and parents to be sure that the courses taken are going to meet graduation requirements for that student. So it's really important, any classes that are added onto that schedule that you consult with your Oregon counselor to make sure that those are working for graduation requirements. Upon acceptance by the college, students should schedule an appointment to meet with their CCP advisor to develop a schedule. 
This college schedule will then be given to the high school counselor so that we can make sure that your schedule is adjusted properly at Oregon. So what courses are available through College Credit Plus? Once you're admitted to a college for College Credit Plus, you may take any course in the college's course catalog that is not remedial or religious. Now they did implement this year, the colleges said that when you are first starting out CCP, you have to take a class that's in their level one catalog. And basically it's several pages of classes you can take. Once you've completed 15 credit hours through CCP, then you're eligible to take anything in their course catalog. But for those first 15 hours, they do need to be in that smaller level one catalog. How do college courses earn high school credit? Most college courses are going to be about three credits. That equals one high school credit. So if you take composition one for three credits, that's gonna equal one full language arts credit at Clay. If you take a three, four, or five semester credit hour class through the college, it's gonna count for one full credit at the high school. Two semester hour class is gonna be two thirds of a high school credit. And a one semester, I'm sorry, a one semester hour college credit is going to be worth a third of a high school credit. CCP does not replace the requirements to earn a high school diploma. So this would include earning your 18 points on the Ohio State test. You must take end of course exams in English 1 and 2 and Algebra 1 and Geometry. You do not have to take the end of course exams in Biology, American Government, and American History if you're enrolled in a CCP course that substitutes. So you would have to check with your counselor to make sure that what you're taking would substitute in. Grades that are earned in CCP courses in the subject areas of American History, American Government, and Biology can substitute for the end of course exams as follows. So if you get an A or a B in that class, you're going to get five OST graduation points. If you get a C, you're going to get four points. A D is three points. And then obviously nothing below a D is going to earn any points. All students must be enrolled in a minimum of five credits per school year. And that means five credits any combination of Oregon City school classes and college classes. So again, if you're taking a three credit hour course at the college, that counts for one credit in these terms. If you're taking a two credit hour class at the college, it's gonna count for two thirds of a credit to equal that five. Students can earn up to 120 college credits in the CCP program total, and students can earn 30 college credits per academic year. So in order to see how many credits you can take each year, we look at the number of high school credits that the student's taking. So in this example, the student is taking American History for one credit, Language Arts 10 for one credit, and Biology for one credit at the high school. So we would take the number of high school credits, which would be three in this scenario. You multiply that by three and you get nine. You then take 30 and subtract that number you just got. So 30 minus nine equals 21. So 21 would be the number of college credits that you're eligible to take that school year. This is something that we as counselors do double check for all of our students to make sure they're not going over. However, ultimately, it is the responsibility of the student and parent to make sure you don't go over. Because if you go over on college credit hours, you can be charged. High school credit and GPA. Students who enroll in option B will receive the letter grade issued by the college, not the percentage on both their college and high school transcript. So we've had instances in the past where students have come in and said, on Oregon's grading scale, I would have received an A, but for the college, this was a B. And we say, that doesn't matter. We're going to issue whatever's on the actual transcript. We're not going to the grade that's on the transcript. We're not going to issue you by the percentage. The college grade will be computed in both the high school GPA as if it's issued by the high school faculty and it's going to be factored into that college GPA. CCP classes are factored into the GPA on the highest grading scale offered by the school for that subject. So what this means is that if the student is taking a social studies class like sociology at the college level, we would look at our social studies classes at Clay High School. We offer AP classes in social studies, so it would be on the AP grading scale. If they are taking a computer class, we don't have any honors level or AP level computer classes, so that would be graded at the general scale. CCP classes will not factor into quarter honor roll, and it may affect recognition in the newspaper in the four-year honor roll. This is something that our students come to us about a lot. They'll say, hey, my name wasn't included in the four-year honor roll. Well, the reason for this is that we don't get quarter grades by the college, so we cannot say whether you made the honor roll or not. We only get a semester grade, so that's just something to factor in. 
how does College Credit Plus impact athletic eligibility? If you are a student athlete, you must remain eligible in accordance with the Ohio High School Athletic Association bylaws. In order to be eligible, you have to be passing five one-credit courses or the equivalent per grading period with the high school and college courses combined. So most CCP courses taken during a semester are going to equal one full Carnegie unit, which allows students to earn more than the required five for athletic eligibility. Ultimately, check with your OCS athletic director to ensure that what you are taking is going to make sure that you are compliant with the rules needed for athletics. As far as academic and social responsibilities, you will be expected to follow the rules and regulations set by the college and university and detailed in the Oregon Student Handbook. So even though you are going to college and possibly even full-time classes, you're still an Oregon City School student. So we still expect you to follow our handbook. You're not permitted to remain on Oregon City Schools campus during the time that you don't have a class. So we can't have students who have CCP for the first three or four periods of the day come and just hang out at Clay. We need to make sure that you're only there during the time that you actually have classes so that we can account for where you are. You also need to alert your high school counselor if you add, drop, or withdraw from a class to ensure that your graduation requirements are being met. Participation in CCP does not guarantee you admission to the college after high school, so you should follow the regular undergraduate application process for whatever college you plan to attend after high school. Selective service. This is a big one for us in Oregon. If we have male students who are 18 years old, they have to register with the selective service. They have 30 days from the time of their 18th birthday to do that. We have a large number of our students who are doing CCP and are not registering for the selective service. And what happens is the college then communicates with the counselors and they say, hey, they are approaching their 30 days after turning 18 and they have not registered with the selective service. And what's going to happen is that that student then becomes financially responsible for all tuition, textbooks, and fees associated with the class because they're no longer considered a College Credit Plus participant. So it's very important for our males, 18 years of age, that they are registering with a selective service. It's a very easy process. They get online. If you just Google selective service, it comes right up and it takes no more than a couple of minutes to fill out that application. So what happens if you fail a class? Classes failed will receive an F on both the high school and the college transcripts and will be computed into the high school and college GPA. Classes withdrawn on or after the 15th day after the college courses begin will receive a W on both the high school and college transcripts, but it will not be computed into the high school or college GPA. So this is basically saying you have 14 days, I'm sorry, classes that are withdrawn on or after the 15th day. So you have that first 14 days that you can decide that you want to drop the class. It, it's not suiting you. It's not right for you. If you wait until after that 14th day, you're going to receive a W. So it's not going to factor into your transcript GPA, but it is going to be reflected on the transcript with the W. You will also become financially responsible for the class at that point. Some colleges may assign you an NC if you receive lower than a C for the class. This would result in no credit on the college and high school transcript, and it does not factor into either GPA. Again, though, we would ask for reimbursement. So basically, if you do not receive a passing grade, if you get an F, a W, an incomplete, an NC, the district is going to ask for reimbursement for the amount of the state funds that we paid to the college on your behalf, and we're also going to ask for reimbursement of the textbook that we paid on your behalf. We will withhold final transcripts and diploma until reimbursement has been made. If you sign up for CCP classes at the college, you have to attend the class. If you no longer plan to attend, you must notify the college or you will be charged for the class and the books. So we've had this happen with some of our students who signed up and then over the summer have moved to a different district or who have decided they're moving in with a different parent, they no longer want to do CCP, but they've already signed up for the class and they decided not to attend, they're then responsible for paying for that class. You have to attend it if you are signed up for the class. We decided this year that we wanted to get some student testimonials because we have several of our students who fail CCP classes. So we wanted to sit down with them and try to figure out why they're failing. So here is what they had to say. This, this is just for this past semester, our students who failed. One said, I failed my CCP class because there was a language barrier with my professor. English was his second language and I really struggled to understand him. We hear this very frequently from our students. Another student said, there was little to no communication with my professor even though I reached out several times. 
I turned in an essay, which received an F because I was told that I wrote on the wrong topic. I had no chance to redo the essay. Another one said, I was having difficulty navigating the online Blackboard system, and I didn't realize that I had assignments due until they're already past the deadline. This student asked his professor if he could turn him in late and was told no. Another student said she turned in a major assignment, but her professor had no record of it. He said she never turned it in and she had no way to prove it. Another student says that she was too overwhelmed balancing the Clay High School classes, her extracurriculars, and college classes. She couldn't keep up with everything, and the online CCP course was the easiest thing to procrastinate on. Another student told me that he felt like he took college classes too early into high school. He just wasn't ready for the commitment that was involved with it. The reality is that when you go to college, you're going to be treated as a college student. You're not going to be treated as a 7th, 8th, ninth, 10th grader. You're going to be treated as an adult. The professors will have limited communication with you. They will not communicate with parents. And you are really treated with a level of responsibility that might be different than what you've experienced in Oregon schools. During the 2017-18 school year last year, we had 18 students. And I have on here, it's approximately 33% of our CCP students. However, I think it's higher. I think it's closer to 50% of our CCP students received an F, NC, or a W. 22 classes were withdrawn or failed, and CHS students had to reimburse the district a total of $3,961 for failed classes, late withdrawals, and non-return books. During the first semester of this year, our CHS students have had to reimburse us for a total of $2,700, so we're on track to be even higher with reimbursements than we were last year. And again, there's a lot of reasons that factor into this, many of which were, were just discussed. We felt like it was important to bring this up because we want to make sure that you really understand what you're getting into with this program. By all means, it's a great program. It can save a ton of money and it can be a very positive experience. But there's also some real potential downfalls of this program. And we want to make sure that you're aware of it so that you're making an informed decision when you sign up. To my college credits transfer after graduation, uh, thanks to Ohio's transfer to degree guarantee, met most of the entry level courses that are taken through CCP are going to transfer to other Ohio institutions. When you start to get out-of-state institutions, it's a little bit different. You'll have to evaluate those on a case-by-case -case basis. I really recommend that you meet with the advisor, the CCP advisor at the college, and talk to them about where you ultimately want to go so they can make sure they're signing you up for classes that are going to transfer to your ideal destination after high school. So the potential pros of CCP, the biggest one is that you can count credits for both high school and college. So you can really get ahead. You can take one composition, one class. It's gonna count for all of your language arts. Um, you can get a lot of college credits and they also are gonna be earning high school credits at the same time. So you're doing double duty with one class. I would say for me, the biggest pro is that you're completing your college degree in fewer terms. So I understand that as a parent, I want my children to be able to go to college and have it not cost me $20,000 per year. So this is a way to help reduce some of that college costs. They can earn several credits before ever even walking into the college. So it's definitely a way to reduce the overall amount of semesters that your student has to go to college. They can also take courses that may not be available at the high school. So sometimes when our students get to senior year, all they have left they have to take is math and English. And they're kind of looking through all of our electives and trying to figure out what they want. CCP is a way of them being able to explore more options than what a high school can offer. They also can experience more diversity from exposure to students of different backgrounds, ages, and beliefs. However, this can also be a con if you're thinking about your seventh grader going on to a college campus and being surrounded by, you know, 23 year olds, and it can just be a very different world than what they're used to. So it can be a con and it can be a pro. Another potential pro is the ability to take online classes, which means more flexibility. So some students want to work during the day or have to take care of a younger sibling or something like that. And this can be a very big pro for them. However, it can also be a con because online classes and flexibility sometimes equals, uh, I have more time, I can push this off to the side, you know, and it's not quite as motivating to do when you don't have a teacher standing over you saying, you need to turn this in right now. It's easy to push off to the side. Potential academic support services that are available to our students. There are computer labs. Usually there's career development services, advising and counseling, tutoring, use of the library, there's usually math labs and writing labs. Other potential services, most students will have access to rec facilities and campus events, sporting events. 
Please note, however, that you are not a college student, you're an Oregon student, so you're not eligible to participate in student clubs or organizations. So you can't go join a fraternity or a sorority or anything like that, even if you're a full-time CCP, because ultimately you are an Oregon City School student still. So we're going to talk about some of the potential cons of CCP. And again, I don't want to make CCP sound all bad because it's not. But we want to make sure that you really understand the cons and that you're making an informed decision. So students who attend classes on a college campus are removed from the high school environment. We have full-time CCP students who I never see unless they decide to stop in one day. So it really is up to the student to be responsible to keep themselves informed. They're missing class meetings. They're missing announcements. They're missing the rings and graduation um, cap and gown orders and all of that kind of stuff, they're not there for. So it's just really important to make sure that they're keeping up on that communication. Students taking on-campus classes have to provide their own transportation and be prepared for increased time for travel. So if you think about snow days, Oregon's closed, chances are UT and Owens are not going to be closed. So they're going to have to travel on days that maybe you don't want your child driving. Also, you got to think about two-hour delays. Our schedule is not always going to meet up with the college schedule. So we might be on a two-hour delay, UT is not, and that really messes up with the schedule. Students also have to abide by the college yearly calendar. So their start and end dates might be very different than Oregon City Schools. They might have different spring breaks. They might have different winter breaks. So your child might be going to spring break at a completely different time than the rest of your children. There may be reduced opportunities for students to participate in high school extracurricular activities. I've had several students who have had to drop extracurricular activities after school because the only time that they could get that CCP class that they wanted was right at the end of the day and they didn't have time to get back to the high school to participate. Students will likely have to make scheduling sacrifices due to class availability. So what this means is that let's say they want to go into a program that only has specific periods like humanities as an example. So they have to be there for let's say periods you know three and seven and they find out that okay the only time that I can get this CCP class is during seventh period now I can't be in humanities. I have to pick or choose between the two. Or maybe they have to pick and choose between a career tech and CCP. Very often they're trying to make choices regarding what's more important to them because it doesn't all fit at the same time. More potential cons is that there could be increased student responsibility for learning because as we talked about before, there's less instructional time and less guidance from the college professors. Students may be exposed to coursework that is geared toward adult learners. They might be exposed to mature topics. As an example, um, we had a student who was taking an art class and they had to draw a nude figure. So that is something that, you know, you really have to think about that it's not going to be the same topics that we're going to cover in a seventh grade classroom in Oregon. <laughs> Students loan and scholarship eligibility could be limited depending on how many hours they've completed. This is something that I honestly don't have a lot of knowledge about, but if you talk to your advisor at the college, they will be able to fill you in more regarding how that might be affected. More potential con I'm sorry, cons are that the Oregon City Schools counselors and administrators are not always given access to CCP grade information until the semester grades are final. So it's impossible for us to keep track of if our students are in danger of failing a course. So very often we're just as surprised as, as the student when we find out that the student got an F in a course. OCS will seek financial restitution for the cost of the course and the cost of the textbook. So that's another con to keep in mind that if your child doesn't do well, you're going to be financially responsible for the class. So can you participate? If you are currently in grades 6 through 11, you can apply for the CCP program for next year. A student is considered eligible for the program if you score at or above the assessment threshold score in at least one subtest. So there's two links here and they are going to be included in this email. If you look at the student eligibility assessment testing, you're going to see the categories of what you have to receive on your ACT or your AccuPlacer test in order to be eligible. If you don't receive those scores, there's also a lower category where you're conditionally eligible if you have a 3.0 or Oregon City School recommendation. But please know that we have decided as a district that we will not give a recommendation if the student fails to meet the required 3.0 GPA. If you have any questions about that testing threshold, um, you're welcome to contact me and I can explain that a little bit further. You may not participate in the CCP program beyond your anticipated high school graduation date. So you can't decide that you're going to fail a class senior year and then come back as a fifth year senior to take all CCP classes. Um, after that four years in high school, you can no longer participate in the program. 
college acceptance and scheduling. Participation in CCP is contingent upon admission to the college. The district will assist the student in gaining admission by providing transcripts, standardized test scores, other related documents, but we will accept no responsibility in the actual admittance or denial of the student. That is up to the college. Students who are awaiting acceptance are gonna register for high school classes as, as if they were not participating in the CCP program. So we will have all students create a full eight period schedule at Clay. And the reason for that is that we need to make sure they're not being locked out of classes. So we're gonna sign them up for everything they need. And then once they bring us a CCP schedule, we will go back and we will revise their Clay High School schedule. In the event that the student withdraws from a college class, the student will be re-enrolled in the high school classes which were previously dropped. And again, it is the student's responsibility to notify Clay High School when a class is to be, or is added, dropped, or withdrawn. We will make reasonable effort in the scheduling to accommodate the needs of the students who we leave in the high school campus in order to participate in the program. However, scheduling conflicts are not the responsibility of the district, so we will not revise the master schedule or overload classes so that we can accommodate a CCP request. So after hearing all of that, if you're interested, now what do you do? By April 1st, you have to notify myself that you intend to participate in College Credit Plus during the 2019-20 school year by returning your intent to participate form, which is attached to this email. Your counselor will contact you with the next steps for application to your chosen college. You and your family are responsible for knowing the steps for application and any important deadlines. All application material can be found on the college's website. The college and university to which you applied will notify you if you've been accepted or denied. You will then schedule an appointment to meet with your CCP academic advisor to create a college schedule. And you will then bring that college schedule back to your counselor before summer break so that we can make the necessary adjustments to your OCS schedule. By April 1st of each year, the student and his or her parent or guardian must complete and submit the intent to participate form, which simply signifies that you are intending to participate the next year it doesn't mean that you are bound to that. It just means that at that point you're intending. Um, failure to meet this deadline will exclude the student from the program for the following school year. So this is saying that every single year you're in the program, you have to get me a new form. You don't have to go through the training again, but you have to give me a new form. Again, signing and submitting that form does not bind you to the CCP program. It simply means that you are intending at that point to participate. For my seniors, we will receive copies of all of your CCP grades and we'll put them on your official high school transcript. However, if you are going to a different university from which you participated in the CCP program, you will be required to request an official transcript to be sent from the CCP institution to the college admission office that you are now going to. We do not have any control over those transcripts and we cannot send those transcripts. We can only send your high school transcript. <clears throat> Bowling Green, Owens, and University of Toledo, those are our typical schools that students go to, though you can go to any public school in the state of Ohio. So those are just some of our local schools, and the websites are on there if you want to look to get more information.